Thank you, Mikaya. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Father, we are thankful that you inspired Matthew by your spirit to write these things down. Now we ask that you would, by your spirit, enable us to understand them, so that by understanding we can, we can become more like your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. I need to thank uh, Santosh. It's been a while since we sang Agnus Dei here. I had mentioned the song before. I am totally unable to sing that song since 1999 uh, for reasons that I have explained before. And even today I was not able to sing. I thought the presence of my students here might uh, enable me to break that barrier, but that didn't happen. So there, thank you for making me cry in front of my students. Anyway, uh, that being <laughs> said. Um, Last Sunday, we completed our study of Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. It was a long journey, beginning soon after Easter and ending about four months later. Today, we begin the study of the life of the other great apostle, Peter, and we are calling this series, Upon This Rock. And uh, this will take us to the middle of October. After that, we will look at the various covenants that God has made with, his, uh, with humans and then we will start counting down to Advent and then Christmas. Now, if you do not know yet, I am a scientist at heart. I like to question things. I, I rarely accept anything just because someone said that it is so. I look for ways of finding out whether a claim is true or not. And this landed me in trouble as a child, unfortunately, especially in the church. I was considered a troublemaker, someone who just asked questions for the sake of it to trouble his teachers, someone who just wouldn't believe what the teachers said. But my questions have always been an expression of honest seeking. Well, that's an exaggeration. <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. So when I read Jesus say elsewhere, seek and you will find in his Sermon on the Mount, I resonate with those words because because it tells me that Jesus himself does not turn away the person who has honest questions and who is seeking honest answers. And so when we read today, when, when today's passage for many years seemed quite out of character for Jesus, we just heard the passage read, so I'm not going to read it again, but the gist is that at the end when Peter begins to sink, he asks Jesus to help him, Jesus saves him from drowning and then asks him, as almost all our translations have it, why did you doubt? Now for a scientifically inclined person such as I, doubt is the path to knowledge. Knowledge is obtained by moving from doubt to clarity by asking the questions that the doubts raise. And all honest questioning must be done then with an understanding that one may not find the answers that one is looking for or even that the theories that one holds might be incorrect. So when I read that Jesus asked Peter, why did you doubt, I begin to wonder what is happening. Is Jesus asking us to simply and blindly believe anything without any justification for that belief? Is Jesus asking us to have the kind of blind faith that many people accuse us of having? Now, this, it cannot be. I cannot accept that because Jesus has already, earlier in Matthew's Gospel itself, told his hearers, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. On that occasion, Jesus told his hearers to experience life with him. Put him to the test. Learn from me. Put him to the test. Find that he can actually give us the unburdened life that we long for. And now could the same Jesus be asking for blind faith? I don't think so. That would be out of character. And so something had to give. Something was out of sync with the rest of what Jesus says. And with that idea in mind, I went back to this passage to say, I'm going to study this in the original Greek text. What I uncovered was something I have never heard in the church, nor even considered myself. 
But of course, I'm not going to spill the beans right away, right? No. Hold on for a little bit. If you do a simple word study of the word doubt in the New Testament, you will come up with quite a few verses. And you will realize, if you're paying attention, that such word searches are not the way to study the Bible. Those of you who are doing that, please pay attention. If you're doing word search Bible studies, pay attention. That's not the way you study the Bible. For example, your word search will throw up verses like Acts chapter 12 verse 11. And you will read there, Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches. Now, if you speak English, you know that the phrase without a doubt actually expresses exactly the opposite of doubt. So if you're going to look for doubt in that verse, it's not there. So your word search is just not going to be a good idea that way. Yeah? So searching for words and trying to understand what the Bible says about a word, that's not the way. As Ludwig Wittgenstein said, the word, the meaning of the word is in its usage, not just a word. Yeah? Anyway, so as I studied, I realized that there are a number of Greek words that are then translated with the single English word doubt. Now, the New Testament doesn't often speak about doubt because it's trying to focus on belief. But the majority of the occurrences of the word doubt come from the Greek verb diakrino. In most contexts, this word actually refers to doubt, the unwillingness to believe. There are other words, however. For example, in Luke's Gospel, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. They think he is a ghost, and then Jesus has a conversation with them and uses the word dialogismos. And in context, most of our translations say doubt, but what it should be is a second guessing. As thinking again, you had an attitude of belief, but then you say, really? And you step back and you think again, and you second guess. When Thomas refuses to believe that Jesus was raised, Jesus addresses him and says he is apistos. Again, we see the word doubt used in our Bibles, but it's mostly untrusting. That's what it means in that context, that trust, have that trust, because right after that Jesus talks about believing and not seeing and seeing and not believing and all those kind of things. We will talk about that in a bit. But then twice and only in Matthew's Gospel, once in today's passage, we see the verb distazo. The other occurrence is in Matthew 28 verse 17 where after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus meets the disciples in Galilee. We read there that the disciples worshipped him, but then the attitude of some is described by Matthew with the word distazo. Let me say it again, distazo. Let me say it again, distazo. Yeah? I've said the word a few times now and you should be thinking of a normal English word that we use quite regularly. Can you think of a normal English word that sounds like this? Distazo. See you people, y'all are great. That's the word, distance. The English word distance actually ultimately derives from this Greek word distazo. Now we can see here how Matthew and Jesus have used this word. Instead of meaning doubt, it, the word means to remain at a distance, to stand apart. Or in other words, idiomatically, to not fully commit oneself. We can see that this actually makes much more sense of both passages. Jesus' words here as well as Matthew's description at the end of his gospel. There, after Jesus' resurrection, some of the disciples worshipped Jesus and the others remained at a distance, non-committal. Now when we consider that worship implies a complete surrender, we can understand then how worship and non-committance are polar opposites of each other, explaining why Matthew used that word rather than diakrino. With that in view, we can now understand what Jesus is saying to Peter. So, in order to do that, let's go over some the action of the story. We go a little before. At the start of chapter 14, 
Matthew tells us about the death of John the baptizer. Then we read about the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And then after everyone has eaten, Jesus told his disciples to go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Unbeknownst to the disciples, Jesus dismisses the crowd and then goes up to a mountain to pray. Meanwhile, a rough wind is making it difficult for the disciples to cross the lake on the boat. Just before dawn, we hear the fourth watch, that's the 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. time slot. Yeah. Uh, so just before dawn, Jesus goes across the lake, walking on the water. Now there are a lot of people who say this can't happen. And yeah, you know, we don't, normally don't see this happen. And a lot of people say that these guys just will, would believe anything. But guess what? Normal humans don't walk on water, so the disciples were not saying, Oh, wonderful, great job. They were terrified. They thought it was a phantasm, is the, is the Greek word there, phantom. We use ghosts. I think phantom would be really nice. Something that you can't really put your hands on. It's there, but is it there? Is it, what is it? And if it were a phantasm, a phantom, it would mean that Jesus had met with an untimely death. Because it looked like Jesus. But no one can walk on the water. So it must be a phantasm. And that must mean that Jesus has died. It must also mean, according to those beliefs, that Jesus' spirit was trapped on this earth. Meaning that he, they had followed the wrong guy all along. Because the good guy's spirits don't remain here. It's the bad guy's spirits that remain here. They were terrified, therefore. And it makes sense then. They're not stupid people. They believe just you believe anything, people walking home. No. They were terrified because this is not what they should be seeing. But Jesus then tells them that it is he and they should not be afraid. And in order to confirm that it was Jesus, Peter told Jesus to call him across to cross the water. Why does he say that? Because if it is phantasm, Jesus is not going to do that. A ghost is not going to ask you to do that because he knows that you can't do that. Because it's only the ghost that is walking on water. So if it is you really, physically, ask me to come. And so Jesus says, come. And Peter goes out of the boat walking on the water. But then he saw the wind, becomes afraid and begins to sink. And when Jesus pulls him out of the water, Jesus asks him, I'm using the Greek now. Oligopiste, eis ti edistasas. Right? Yeah. Oligopiste, eis ti edistasas. Now our translations do a, a massive amount of damage to this thing. We seem to have some strange idea that Jesus was some super serious person with no sense of humor. That he walked around like most of the movies you know, with like six inches above the ground, just talking in monotones, and and we believe people would follow him. Come on, people, would you follow someone who talked like the Jesus as we see in the movies? You would not. No one would. No one would even bother to crucify such a person. He's so boring. Goodness, let him die in peace. Anyway, so Jesus had a very, very active sense of humor. A robust one, I would say, sometimes making his disciples the butt of his jokes. My students should pay attention to this. Now anyway, we have just such an instance here. You could search all of Greek literature and you will not find anyone else using these two, the juxtaposition of the two words, oligos, normally meaning little, small or few, and pistis, normally meaning belief or faith or trust. Nowhere will you find this, except in commentaries after that, because now Jesus has used it, right? So we could use it. But before that, you will not find it any, anywhere. Only Jesus, it seems, has used this word as an original word. And it is only in this passage that he uses it as a vocative, that is to address someone. The construction is not you of little faith. No. He's addressing Peter directly. 
And the best way to translate it, keeping in mind the humor of the situation, is fleeting faith. He's calling Peter, hey, fleeting faith. Hey, fleeting faith. Yeah, why? Now next week we will see Jesus give Peter two more titles. Jesus loved giving titles to people and we will see that. And he gives Peter two more titles next week, we will see that. But here he calls him fleeting faith. You see, Peter had expressed immense faith just moments before when he asked Jesus, call me across the water. And then he acts on that faith and went off on the water. And he said, you have little faith? Goodness gracious, that is immense faith. Which of you would be able to do that? Think about it, in that situation you are terrified, you think there is a ghost there and you are willing to say, call me across? And then when he says, you are going to go? That is big faith, not little faith. That is big faith. And our translation missed the point that he had actually shown a lot of faith. But it disappeared like that. That is what Jesus is pointing. Fleeting faith. What happened? Fleeting faith. What happened? It is important to observe how Matthew narrates the story. Because as soon as this faith disappears, Peter saw. What did he see? Let's go to the text. Yeah, Matthew tells us, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. How do you see the wind? Does it have a color? What is its shape? How big is it? Can you put your finger on it? Yeah? More to the point, how or why was Peter able to see the wind? When he saw the wind, not when he saw the waves. We all know how to see waves. When he saw the boat being tossed about, yes, we can do it. But when he saw the wind, and you, next time you see the wind, please call me because I would like to know how to see it. Jesus gives us the answer right there. Something that is quite uncharacteristic for him, something that I normally borrow from you know, because I have still to give you the answer to what I discovered, right? Right? Yeah, okay. But because our translations have insisted on using this word doubt, why did you doubt? We have not been able to see what he is telling Peter. You see, doubt is a feeling of uncertainty, lack of conviction. And for centuries we have assumed that Jesus is chastising Peter for doubt, as though doubt were the antithesis of faith. But faith is precisely not certainty. Yeah? You can't be. It is trust in the face of uncertainty. Faith and doubt are not antithetical to each other. In fact, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have faith without doubt. Because as soon as doubt is removed, you have certainty. And if there is certainty, you don't need to believe anything more. There is no room for faith if you have no doubt. So if anyone tells you that they believe and do not doubt, doubt what they say and do not believe it. You cannot believe and not doubt. You can doubt and not believe, but you cannot believe and not doubt. But what Jesus is telling Peter here, he uses the word distazo, is that Peter remained non-committal. Peter began to sink because he remained at a distance. So like now, what does that mean? In 2012, Christopher Nolan released the final installment of his Dark Knight trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises. If you have not seen the movie, I am not apologizing for spoilers, too bad, you had enough time. Okay. Although, in my opinion, not as good as the earlier movie, The Dark Knight, this one had a remarkable scene. Bruce Wayne is being held prisoner <coughs> in this prison that is basically a deep pit with a cave kind of thing. He repeatedly tries to escape by climbing up this narrow shaft with a rope around his waist to prevent him from falling to his death should he miss a foothold 
or not make that final jump. Now, we are told that only one person had escaped from this pit, a child. And the child had not even used a rope. Silly child. Anyway. But each time Bruce attempts to escape, he fails. And he returns to his cell dejected. And then there's a conversation with a fellow prisoner and he tells this person that he does not fear death. And the prisoner replies, you do not fear death? You think this makes you strong? It makes you weak. How can you move faster than possible, fight longer than possible, without the most powerful impulse of the spirit, the fear of death? When Bruce clarifies that he really fears, what he really fears is dying in that pit, the inmate tells him, then make the climb as the child did without the law without the rope, and then fear will find you again. You see, as long as he had the rope to break his fall, he could afford to fall. The rope that provided security also gave a huge disincentive to trying with all his might. The rope gave him a contingency plan, a plan B, and so plan A was never achieved. This made me think of the Gospel of John there where Jesus tells Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. That's us. While many of us, I myself, may have wished to have walked with Jesus two millennia ago, I wrote a song about that also, Jesus actually tells his disciples that his presence will actually hold them back. Thomas could not believe without seeing precisely because he had seen Jesus alive and seen him die. It is the senses, his, his immediate senses of seeing Jesus that made it difficult for him to believe. And here we see Peter could not commit himself fully in this act of following Jesus because Jesus was there to save him from drowning. This trap is something that Peter does not escape from till we see him in Acts chapter 2. He is still in the same rut in Acts chapter 1. All through the Gospels we see him on many occasions display immense faith that quickly dissipates. Fleeting faith. But the main hurdle, strangely enough, was Jesus' presence. Let me say that again because this is not something you hear in the church. The main hurdle was Jesus' presence. And this is something that Jesus himself realizes along the way, finally coming to the conclusion that it is best for his disciples that he leaves. It is better that I go. Because if I go, then the Holy Spirit can come. As long as I am here, you are going to hold on to me and not be able to be transformed into me. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. For Peter, as long as Jesus was there, he knew Jesus would protect him, and so he did not need to fully take this plunge. And so you see, what Jesus repudiates Peter for is not his doubt. Jesus knows that faith and doubt go hand in hand. Jesus knows that the only person, only a person who has faced the doubts and who recognizes his or her weaknesses can actually make the, the move to a robust faith that will not be destroyed by every slight obstacle. What Jesus repudiates in Peter is his non-committal attitude. In the last book of the Bible, Jesus tells the church in Laodicea that he hates their lukewarm character sitting on the wall hedging their bets, being neither hot and therefore medicinal or cold and refreshing, but being two-minded. The same thing is true about Peter. Jesus tells him that he has not fully committed to following Jesus, which is why he begins to sink. And in that non-committal state, Peter saw the wind. Peter saw what is essentially invisible. 
Strangely enough, because he was clinging on to the visible, tangible Jesus, he made the intangible tangible, the invisible visible and began to fear. Because when what is supposed to be invisible becomes visible, it is frightening. When what is supposed to be vis invisible becomes visible, it is frightening. Faith is a strange thing. Jesus never asks us to have blind faith. Never in the Bible do we hear God say that we should believe, you know, blindly believe. Rather, God says, invites us to reason with Him, experience Him, and see that He is good. God opens Himself up to our examination, makes Himself vulnerable, so that we can have that experience and confirm that He is good. But faith is a strange thing. The more certainty we seek, the less room we leave in which faith can operate. The more proof we have, the less we need to commit. The more security we enjoy, the fewer risks we are able to take. But Peter experiences something even stranger, though it would take him a few years to actually for that experience to truly sink in. What he experiences is the fact that the more you try to make one invisible thing, in this case faith, visible by holding on to Jesus, the more other invisible things, in this case the wind, also become visible and potentially threatening. The more you try to prove with absolute certainty the basis of faith, something that is inherently unprovable, the more distanced you will be from the true objective of faith total surrender and worship. And the more you will open yourself up to having other things also provide proofs of their powers. Peter would realize slowly that his commitment to Jesus had to be complete. Only then would he truly be able to live in the full power of Jesus, fully in sync with the Holy Spirit. But for us today, there are two extremes we must avoid. First, we must steer clear from blind faith that has never withstood any questioning. For at the slightest disturbance, such a faith will crumble. It is precisely the fostering or rather the festering of such untested faith within the church that is the reason why so many leave the church disenchanted. We do not treat their doubts with the respect that they deserve. We do not treat their questions with the respect they deserve. We dismiss them, give offhand answers, backhanded replies, and then we wonder why they leave. Second, we must resist the temptation of wanting solid proof that precludes the possibility of faith. This is precisely the, it is a precisely the prerequisite of undeniable faith, undeniable proof amongst those who are outside the church that keep them from embracing a life fueled by faith. There is a healthy, reasonable doubt. Guess what? A vibrant life with Jesus is what lies behind, or rather beyond, reasonable doubt. Amen.